Let's honor the ancestors. Let's honor the fact that we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And all those suffragettes in their white just marching, marching and shouting for a woman's right to vote. And then, you know, let's always, always be accurate about history. Black women can vote until 1965. But it's time to, and we can now. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> so let's honor the ancestors. Reason one to, to vote. Reason number two. Everything is at stake. Everything. You can go down the list we just discussed. You can talk about our public schools. Joe and I are going to triple Title I funding, understanding that our children are in these schools with incredible God-given talent, but they need the resources to achieve their talent. We are going to put $70 billion into HBCUs because as a proud graduate of an HBCU, I know what they do to contribute to national and international leadership. You know. So much is at stake. It is at stake that right now there are 545 children who, because of the United States government, don't know where their parents are because of a child separation policy at the border, which is a human rights offense that was committed by the United States government. What is at stake is creating a pathway to citizenship, renewing a promise to our dreamers by renewing DACA protections. Everything is at stake. So that's reason number two to vote. Reason number three. So I've been traveling all over the country. I've been in North Carolina and Georgia and Florida. In fact, I'm going to Florida when I leave here. Uh, Ohio, you name it. And um, all over our country, and especially after 2013 when the Supreme Court gutted Shelby v. Holder, gutted the Voting Rights Act, we've seen states, you know, at least two dozen states, put in place policies and laws that have been designed to suppress the vote. In North Carolina, in fact, the court that reviewed their law said it was written with, quote, surgical precision to make it difficult for black people in North Carolina to vote. Around our country, we have seen policies and laws that have been designed to, to, to make it hard for folks to vote. You know here in Texas where they pulled up the drop boxes and so in Harris County with 11 million people, there is one drop box, are you kidding me? In states where if people vote by mail, well, you gotta fill out the thing, the ballot, then put it in one envelope, then you gotta be sure to put it in the second envelope, and then be sure you sign that envelope or get somebody to sign it for you. The President of the United States on the debate stage who openly solicited voter suppression, and not to mention, they're messing with the post office. I mean, the post office. Rodney Ellis, where are you? The post office. Like, the nicest people work for the post office. They're messing with the post office. And so all of this has to lead us to ask the question, why are so many powerful people trying to make it so difficult and confusing for us to vote. And I think we know the answer. The answer is because they know our power. They know our power. They know our power to stand up and exercise our voice through our vote. They know that we know that when we vote, things change. They know when we vote, we win. So let's not let anyone, not this election or ever, take our power from us. Let's not anyone, not let anyone, 
make us feel a concern or our anxiety about whether we matter. Let's not give anybody that power over us to ever make us question whether we matter, whether we count. We have the power. We were born with it. They didn't give it to us. It wasn't granted to us. It is ours. So we know what we have to do. We have to get everybody out. In four days, on November 3rd, that Tuesday, and make sure that especially during this pandemic when people are feeling alone and we got to social isolate and people are wearing a mask so you can't really see their full face and you're just feeling like, I don't know, feeling kind of alone. Let's remind people they are not alone and we are all in this together.